is away at National Guard duty, and we hope that he completes that safely, and we look forward to seeing him soon. Um, but he is away in service of our country. Um, and uh, with that, I would just say we should move to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, the first item on our agenda is the review of the minutes um, of meetings held June 4th and June 14th. And I think we perhaps should take them up separately in case there's any changes. So is there a motion on the 4th? Anne? I would um, move approval of the minutes of June 4th, 2007 with some changes. Okay. Is there a second? second. <laughs> My changes or um, suggestions on uh, the second page, item number 92. Um, I wasn't sure I understood what this meant, and perhaps it's just me being confused. It was um, number 92, Turf Field Committee. Um, it said, Manager McGovern suggested making a motion to table this issue since this would negate item number 91. So I wasn't sure, did that, did that mean, I couldn't remember what we had done exactly. Did that mean that if we had dealt with item number, uh, that, that tabling it would negate it? Or the way it's written, it, that tabling it would negate it? Or that? I thought it was just that it was not necessary due to the adoption of item 91. OK, that was if, no one else has a problem, if no one else has I was confused by the way it was written, and I just thought for the record. But if no one else has a concern, that's fine. And then perhaps we should say, since this item is unnecessary due to. I, I think if it's said to table this issue in light of the vote on item, item. 91. I, I would really I think that would be better. Thank you. Um, and then um, on the fifth page, it was, it's at the top of the page. It's item number 101. Um, the first line that's over to the left uh, margin, it says, motion to accept heirs from Dorothy Scott. I think that should say motion to accept release from heirs of Dorothy Scott. A release deed. A, a release deed from the, the heirs. heirs of Dorothy Scott. Okay. And then. Excuse me, it actually should be release deeds since it was more than one deed. Okay, release deeds. <laughs> and then go, moving down, it said uh, ordered that the uh, Cape Elizabeth Town Council accept the release of, it must be accept the release deeds. Mm -hmm. Yes, from. From heirs of Dorothy Scott and discuss the further acquisition, not accusation, of land. And um, the only other thing, this is just more of a typo on page six, the last uh, <coughs> item before ordered, uh, before workshop, it says ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council adjourn council meeting number nine it's, it should be 2007. It's just got an extra zero in it. So those are the changes I would propose. I, I had one other suggestion, too, on item 99, um, where we say ordered that the Cape Elizabeth Town Council approve the recommended appointments. I think the list of appointments should be attached to the minutes. I think for the record. that's a good idea. Are there any other changes, David? Um, I had noted in um, at the top of page five the same items that Councillor Swift Kayata had noted, and there was actually one other place in that same motion that requires a comparable change. At the top of page five, um, line two, 
where it says motion was made to accept the release of the heirs. Mm. Again, that one also should say to accept the release deeds from the heirs of Dorothy Skye. And then on page six, um, with regard to the purchase of the acquiring the fractional interests, um, it says motion was made to authorize the town manager to spend up to thirty thousand dollars to acquire fractional interests, plural, <clears throat> in the Lovett heirs parcel. And then a few lines farther down, the same thing, where it says ordered that. Again, it should refer to fractional interests, plural. Okay. That's it. Thank you. Is there further discussion on the minutes of June 4th? Okay. Seeing none, all in favor? It's a vote, 6 0. Okay, now let's take up the minutes of June 14th. Is there a motion? Move to accept. And a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Six zero. Okay. It's a vote. And moving right along here. Reports and correspondence. First, I'm sorry, presentations? <coughs> That's what I was going to. Cynthia. Um, I understand, Cynthia, you have something that you'd like to share with the town and the yes, council? I do, and with your permission, may I go ahead? Yes, you may. Thank you. Please do. Uh, yes, fellow councillors and members of the public. Um, as many of you know, I have the honor of serving in a dual capacity for the citizens of Cape Elizabeth as a town councilor as well as a state legislator. And it is in the state legislator capacity that I was asked to make part of Maine's permanent state record, the deep appreciation that we as a town, and specifically the members of the conservation committee, have for our town planner, Maureen O'Meara. And so if you wouldn't mind, Maureen, if you could join me, please for a brief reading, an excerpt of our state record. Be it known to all, the state of Maine, that we, the members of the Senate and House of Representatives, join in recognizing Maureen K. O'Meara of Cape Elizabeth, which you really are of Cape Elizabeth, whether you like it or not, <laughs> who has served as the town planner since October 1990. In her impressive 17-year tenure, she has preserved and enhanced Cape Elizabeth's commitment to the preservation of open space while improving public access to it through development of the Greenbelt Trail system. Ms. O'Meara was a major resource for the current Greenbelt Plan, which was named Plan of the Year by the Maine Association of Planners, a distinction typically awarded to professional outside consultants. Members of Cape Elizabeth Conservation Commission prize her wealth of knowledge and credit her with the town's vision to establish a town-wide network of greenbelt trails by connecting the town center to important open spaces. She has also served as chair of the Northern New England chapter of the American Planning Association and is a current member and past vice president of the Portland Area Comprehensive Transportation Study, which is part of the Greater Portland Council of Governments. Maureen's work exemplifies the spirit of Maine that makes our quality of life and place so remarkable and unique. We extend our appreciation to Ms. O'Meara for her commitment to her community and state, and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent for forthwith on behalf of the 123rd legislature and the people of the state of Maine. And this was given um, and made part of the state uh, historical record on the 23rd day of May 2007 and signed by Beth Edmonds, President of the Senate, Glenn Cummings, Speaker of the House, and the Secretary of the Senate and the Clerk of the House. And it is with deep appreciation and great pleasure that I present this sentiment to you. Thank you.
And I understand that since the sentiment was um, prepared and made part of the record, she has achieved even more. And um, with um, the, I think, assistance of um, Mr. Polsover, we're going to um, applaud you a little bit more. So stay right here. Okay. And I welcome Mike Polsover. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, Maureen, okay. I, 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 Mike Pulsifer, I, I'm on the Conservation Commission, and uh, I must say that it's, it's, this lady is remarkable. You've worked with her much longer than I have, but as part of the Conservation Commission, I just am one of the representatives that would like to say, Maureen, that you have been so helpful in, in everything that you've done, and, and, and this community is better off because of your, uh, your expertise and time. So thank you very much on behalf of everyone, and, and I'm going to give you a hug instead of this. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Yes, you may sit down. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you, Mike. And uh, I just note that the, I think the rest of the Conservation Commission, or most of you, are here, and thank you as well for not just showing up tonight, but all those Saturday trail days and the other work that you all do. So thank you all. Are there other reports or correspondence? Councilors, Jim? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, one of the town council's goals this year is to have a councilor attend uh, at least one meeting of each of the town's major uh, commissions, committees, and boards uh, that do not already include a councilor. And since our last regular meeting, I've had the pleasure of attending uh, meetings of both the uh, Community Services Advisory Commission and also the Fort Williams Advisory Commission, uh, from whom we'll be hearing a little bit later on tonight. Um, I'd like to thank both of those commissions for the, the warm welcomes I received, but I'd particularly like to thank them for the work they're doing. They're both doing marvelous jobs, and it's been mentioned by the Appointments Committee several times what a great bunch of people that we have working on our commissions, and I can't reiterate that enough. Thank you. Um, the other thing I had was we'll likely be hearing a lot more in the coming year from uh, Chairman McKinney about the Greater Portland Council of Government. Uh, but while I have the floor, I'd just like to say what a joy it was on uh, June 21st uh, as a delegate to the General Assembly of GPCOG to help elect Paul as president of that organization. Um, most of us know that Paul is very passionate about regionalization and uh, intermunicipality cooperation. And I know that he'll bring the same type of kind and, and uh, considerate leadership to that group that he does to our town council. So uh, Paul, wherever you are, uh, <laughs> thank you very much and congratulations and I wish you the best for a successful term as president. Thank you, Jim. Other councilors? Okay, Michael, your turn. Town manager's report. Uh, thank you, Marianne. I just want to thank the Conservation Commission, uh, as well as Cynthia, uh, Representative Dill, for uh, recognizing uh, Maureen. It's nice to see a staff person being uh, recognized for the good work that they do. And I know Maureen uh, lots of nights, and I even ran into her last Sunday, a uh, week ago Sunday, here in the office. So uh, very, very dedicated and appreciate your recognition of that. Uh, secondly, I'd like to make mention that this is April's last meeting as town clerk and she'll be uh, joining a full-time real estate career uh, at around beginning July 27th is her last day with us and uh, wish her well in her new career endeavors and I've enjoyed working with her in all the different roles that she has here as town clerk in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, folks see what goes on at the, the meetings here but there's, there's a lot more that goes on in the background. Uh, so, many, so many different responsibilities, general assistance in the cemetery and the elections and so many things and appreciate uh, all of the contributions. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. That's it. Oh, one other thing. The turf field is open beginning this evening. There's a girls soccer uh, game now going on in the field and it's the first official use. So good to see it underway and hope that uh, the rain stays off it for a little bit. So thank you. I just ask you if you could give us a quick update on construction. I get a lot of questions, especially with Beach to Beacon about to happen. Is everything going to be finished before the race or what the status is? So maybe you could. The decision really at this point is, is nothing's going to be finished before the race. Uh, the danger now is you, you try to begin things and the last thing you want is 
to have uh, about 5,000 people running over a construction site. The, the work that the Portland Water District has been doing, though, uh, on Route 77 is nearly done, that portion. Uh, MDOT, Maine Department of Transportation, has had on their list to pave that section of uh, Route 77 from roughly the church back to the end by the sea, and that will be done when MDOT is ready to do it. Uh, not, I can't be confident about the date. Uh, the traffic light at the high school entrance should be going out to bid uh, within the next uh, month, uh, and we expect it to be installed in September. Uh, there's a meeting tomorrow with the Maine Department of Transportation on the proposed traffic light at the intersection of Route 77, uh, Shore Road, uh, and uh, Scott Dyer Road, and that, that will be interesting to see what they've come up with. Uh, Bob and I had a meeting with the Maine Department of Transportation uh, a few weeks ago, yeah, maybe a week ago, on the Spurwink Avenue project. Uh, that one they're hoping to put out to bid in August. They've indicated that they will do some of the ditch work and some of those things this fall, uh, but they probably will not do the paving itself, so we're stuck with another winter of bumpy Spurwink Avenue. Uh, there's been a sewer project ongoing on Wood Road and Geldar Lane. Uh, that was due to have final paving today. It'll be tomorrow. Hmm? It'll be tomorrow. It'll be tomorrow. The, the rain's causing havoc on a few schedules, but uh, uh, any other projects I'm forgetting? Oh, that's that's most of them. So is that what you're looking Thank for? Thank you. That's what I was okay. looking for. I've had a lot of questions, so <laughs> better you should answer them. Okay. Cynthia. If I just may briefly report, um, I missed the last town council meeting, and I apologize for my absence. I was busy up at the legislature, and I just wanted to um, publicly thank um, the town councilors, um, Councilor Lynch, Councilor Swift Kayata, and all the others who supported me in my efforts to um, have an impact on the school consolidation proposals to allow Cape Elizabeth and other schools to be exempt from mandatory consolidation because of high performance and efficiency. And so to the extent that everyone was sort of helping me um, get that amendment through and, um, and supportive of that effort, I really appreciate it because it was definitely a group team effort and it was uh, great to have such a supportive community um, in that endeavor. So thank you very much. Well, we certainly appreciate your work on that. And I just take this opportunity to, to remind the public there's a public forum tomorrow night. And I can't remember. 730. 7.30 here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's open to the public. The school board is hosting it. And the issue is school consolidation and where the town goes from here. So I um, would encourage people to come. And again, thank you, Cynthia, for your work in mm -hmm. enabling Cape Elizabeth to remain an independent school if that's what the town and school board choose to pursue but you did a great job getting that amendment through okay. um, at this point um, um, on the agenda um, it is open for citizens to discuss items that are not on our agenda so if there is anyone who would like to address the town council on any matter not on our agenda um, now is a time to do it. You can also choose to do it at the end of our meeting as well. And seeing no one, we will go to item 104. And um, that is the proposed amendments to the construction code and public hearings. And Jim uh, Rowe is the chairman of our ordinance committee. So Jim, I'd ask you to introduce this item before we open it up to public hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, as Marianne said, as we voted at our June 4th uh, town council meeting. Tonight we'll hold uh, public hearings on proposed amendments to the town's building construction code, the fire prevention code, and the sewer ordinance. Uh, this has been a work in progress over the past few months, primarily involving code enforcement officer Bruce Smith, fire chief Phil McGoldrick, uh, but also the town manager, uh, the council very briefly last month, and the ordinance committee. Uh, in reviewing ordinance, uh, it became evident to Bruce a while back that some of the uh, material that we'd had on our books had become quite outdated. Uh, I wish to thank him and, and Chief McGoldrick and Manager McGovern for, bring, for bringing those issues to our attention. 
Uh, the state of Maine has mandated that any municipality that is installing or uh, new code or that is revising existing code must adopt the International Residential Code, the International Building Code, the National Fire Prevention Association Fire Prevention Code, and the International Sewer Code, uh, as published in 2003 by the International Code Council. Municipalities are permitted to uh, insert special provisions to address local needs, but the intent here is to create an overall umbrella type framework under which not only all main communities, but communities across the country and, and in fact around the world can operate and uh, protect the, the uh, safety of its citizens and the environment. Um, you find the actual proposed changes in your packets, but I'll give a brief synopsis of each for the public and uh, hopefully we can uh, breeze right through this. The proposed changes to the Building Construction Code are primarily in form only. Uh, the rudiments of our existing code remain with only one substantive uh, change. It is a very minor change, and that change is to increase the net size of first floor egress windows from 5.0 to 5.7 square feet. This change keeps our town's code in compliance with current state rules. The other changes are simply to cite appropriate references in international code documents and to insert local identification information and existing local data and standards where they are called for. The proposed changes to the Fire Prevention Code are again to keep our rules in compliance with the NFPA or the National Fire Prevention Association rules, which, is the, which are the basis for the State of Maine rules. The most noticeable changes here include dispersing, uh, dispensing excuse me, with gender specific language and replacing this with gender neutral language, thus making it more politically correct and also inserting local information into the prescribed format. And uh, due to the obsolescence of parts of our sewer code, sewer ordinance, uh, we are proposing that the text of existing Article 2 be deleted and simply replaced with reference to appropriate international code. We agree that Article 3 of the sewer ordinance is superfluous and that it should be deleted its, in its entirety. And we also propose that the technical standards for construction that are currently found in the sewer ordinance be removed and that appropriate standards be developed by the public works director, approved by the town manager, and filed with the town clerk as recommended by the town, town manager. <coughs> uh, I note that Code Enforcement Officer Smith, uh, Chief McGoldrick, and obviously Manager McGovern are here tonight. Uh, if there are any questions uh, of a specific or technical nature, I'm sure they'd be happy to help answer them. Uh, again, I wish to thank all those who have taken part in the process to date, department heads, the manager, the Ordinance Committee and Council. And that said, I would ask uh, the Chair to open the public hearing, and given that I anticipate that these uh, proposed changes probably won't generate much controversy, uh, and if the Council is willing, I'd suggest that we hold all three hearings concurrently and simply ask those who wish to speak to identify which body of code or ordinance they are addressing. If this is acceptable, I would so move. I don't, do we don't need a vote on that, do we? We could just have a public mm. hearing. Yeah. Okay. Certainly acceptable. Okay. okay. Well, at this point, um, I would open up for public hearing items 104, 105, and 106, and that is the um, amendments to the construction, the fire, uh, the construction and fire codes, and the sewage sewerage ordinance. So, if there's anyone who would like to speak on any of those three items. Please come forward, state your name and address. And seeing none, I will close these three public hearings and move to um, entertain a motion on item 104. Jim? I move that the proposed changes to the Building Construction Code, the Fire Prevention Code, and the Sewer Ordinance, as recommended by the Code Enforcement Officer, by the Fire Chief, by the Town Manager, and by the Ordinance Committee be adopted. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion? Cynthia? Um, I would just briefly note that, um, in my view, making the um, various ordinances gender neutral is not something that's politically correct, but rather just grammatically correct. correct. I'm sure that's what correct. you meant. <laughs> Both. <laughs> Thank you. Well said. Okay. Further discussion? Okay, the motion is to adopt all three ordinances. All in favor? 
Okay, six zero. It's a vote. Thank you. Moving on to item 107. This is a um, receipt of a report um, from the Fort Williams Advisory Commission. And I see the chairman, Chuck Wilson, here. I'm wondering, Chuck, if you'd like to say anything before we accept your report. I'm told you'd like to say something. You were told that? I was told Just that. Very briefly, uh, we were pleased to be able to submit our report. I'm sorry that we didn't get it to you before the June meeting. It was in the process, but I didn't realize that you had changed your June meeting, so I was late getting it to you. But we're, we had promised to get it to you by the 1st of June, uh, so we sort of did that. Uh, also, we, we appreciated the opportunity back in January of being able to have the joint workshop with the council, with the Charitable Foundation and ourselves. That was very helpful in helping us focus uh, very quickly on where we thought we ought to be. And uh, we are also pleased to report that the priority report, which was sort of an update of the comprehensive plan, was done without the need of a consultant. So that was all done in-house. Uh, we think that's pretty good as well. Uh, we are, I'm pleased to report that we have an outstanding working relationship with the foundation uh, and that uh, Joel and his folks have worked hand in hand with us on this and have, have agreed uh, that uh, what we have put forward is uh, agreeable to them and that they would move forward with a plan to try to fund it once we get some consensus and I assume at some point you folks will be having a workshop on that, that all you're doing this evening is uh, receiving the report and setting it up for some future date. So I'll limit my comments to that. But I would like, if we, if we may, I'd like to have Joel come up if he has any uh, comments he'd like to make. Please. Good evening. I'll be just as brief as Chuck was. Um, we, we got off to a great start in January with the joint meeting, uh, and we really appreciate that opportunity to begin a very constructive dialogue with the Town Council and the Advisory Commission. Um, we have worked openly and cooperatively ever since. I, think, I don't think either one of us has had a meeting uh, in which uh, uh, another member of the other committee has not been in attendance, so that's been, that's been very encouraging. We do support the recommendations. Uh, I'll have to be honest with you, some of the recommendations don't have as high a fundraising potential as others, um, but once the final decision is made, uh, we're prepared to uh, initiate an aggressive and comprehensive uh, campaign that incorporates those recommendations with a large vision of what Fort Williams Park can mean for the uh, citizens of, of, of this region uh, in the future, and we're really looking forward to it. So, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Please um, extend our thanks to both the Fort Williams Advisory Commission members and to the Charitable Trust for all the work that's gone into this report. We really appreciate all the time and effort. Thank you. Looks like a good report. Is there a motion? Anne? I move that we acknowledge receipt of this report and extend our appreciation to the Fort Williams Advisory Commission and to the Foundation also. Second. Uh, second. Okay. Any discussion? All in favor? It's a vote. Six zero. Okay. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Joel. And item 108 is the proposed policy for the naming of facilities on school grounds. I was told Alan Hawkins would be here, but I don't see him, so we'll have the manager fill in for Alan. Uh, thank you, Marianne. A uh, couple of months back, particularly as it related to the naming of Hannaford Field, it was discussed that there needed to be a process for uh, the naming of fields, and I drew up a draft policy, sent it to the school board, and they ultimately adopted a policy on May 8, 2007, which essentially provides that anything in a school building that they would be responsible for naming, uh, they would not need approval for the town, from the town council. But if there was if there was an athletic field, something outside, a building, or a school itself that would need to be approved by the town council. 
And I think it's important in addition to the school board approving a policy that the town council also approve the policy since the town council has a role in it and since you're, you're in essence determining when they make the decision and when you need to make the decision as well. Uh, so I would recommend that you adopt the policy as approved by the school board on May 8, 2007 for the naming of facilities on school grounds. Okay. Is there a motion? Cynthia. I move that we adopt the policy as adopted by the school board on May 8, 2007 regarding the uh, naming of facilities on school grounds. Second. Second. Okay. Discussion? Seeing none, all in favor? Six zero. It's a vote. Thank you. And item 109 is the school board's proposal <coughs> to designate the middle school athletic field, and I think that's specifically the baseball field, as the Ray E. Moulton athletic field. And Michael, do you want to speak to that? I'd be happy to. It's the, I believe there's a map somewhere in the, in the packet here on the, the very last sheet maybe. Mm -hmm. And what it shows, it's the area along Scott Dyer Road uh, that constitutes, it's not only a baseball field, but it's also the school playground. It's that whole parcel uh, on Scott Dyer Road it, to the uh, left as you go down the uh, the driveway that accesses the middle school and the elementary school. Uh, the school board proposal was a unanimous vote, again, uh, back last month. And it was a recommendation that came from the principal of the high school as well as the athletic director to name the middle school baseball field. But originally, but as you, as you look at the definition, is what they come up with, it's actually, it's actually that whole area. Uh, but anyway, uh, Ray Moulton, I think a lot of the council is aware, attended Cape High School in the 1950s. Uh, he was a very inspirational, despite some handy, personal handicaps. He, uh, he was quite an athlete and uh, was following his career here and his, uh, his, his work here as a student in Cape Elizabeth. He also had a very successful career. Uh, you know, did, did very well in business and as a result of that, he remembered his, his old high school and his hometown. Uh, he really provided some of the impetus to create the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation uh, by having made a contribution to set up a scholarship fund for high school graduates, uh, graduating seniors. That award, uh, three seniors are given scholarships each year uh, and the total amount is $15,000. Uh, he sadly passed away last year, but before he did that, he ensured that the the scholarship was sufficiently funded so that that $15,000 could be sustained in perpetuity. So extremely generous to the community. Uh, he also, uh, as mentioned at a previous meeting, uh, he was the one that really showed the potential with, of getting the turf field going by making a substantial donation to the lighting uh, of, the, of, of the fields the, for the cost of that. So uh, very inspirational individual. Uh, the school board uh, felt very strongly that this is an appropriate recognition uh, of Mr. Moulton. His sister, Jesse Timberlake, is here, uh, so most of you know. And uh, again, I'd like to pass along the unanimous recommendation of the school board to designate the middle school athletic field as the Ray E. Moulton Athletic Field, spelled R-E-Y. Do I have a motion? David. I move that the town council, consistent with the unanimous school board vote on June 12, 2007, designate the middle school athletic field as the Ray E. Moulton athletic field. Is there second. A second. Numerous seconds. Okay, discussion? Well deserved. Well deserved, I think. So, with that, um, all in favor? And 6-0, it's a vote. Thank you, thank you. And the next item on our agenda is um, item 110, the proposed new comprehensive plan. Um, and I am told that Maureen O'Meara wishes to speak to this item. She has to work tonight, too. 
Are you looking for an overview or a summary or questions? How do you want to handle that? A brief overview. A very brief very overview. Very brief overview. Okay. Just enough so the public understands what will happen in September. Great, great. So the council appointed a comprehensive plan committee, asked them to prepare a draft plan. That plan was completed the end of February of this year. The draft plan has been presented to the town council. The council has held, I think it was uh, two workshops with the committee and then a workshop um, that focused on your own interest in and, and excuse me, revisions to the draft plan. The draft plan is on the town's website for anyone to review. Uh, and what you have tonight uh, is a summary of revisions to the draft that have been requested by the council following the June 14th workshop. So if you accept these revisions as presented or revise them further, um, I would incorporate them into the draft, uh, repost the draft plan on the website, and the council would then hold a public hearing on that final draft at your September meeting. Okay. Thank you, Maureen. Okay. Questions for Maureen? I gather then what would be in order would be two motions, one to adopt the revisions for the purposes of a public hearing, and then a motion to set the public hearing. Is that? Yes? If the further revisions, how do those get incorporated between tonight and the public hearing? No. How do they get incorporated? They're actually already part of the document. I just have to um, incorporate the tracked changes, and they would become part of the draft document, send it to the webmaster, and she would post it on the website. But I mean, if. if yep somebody else weighs in or there's in other words are there no more revisions between now and the public hearing or will there revisions would be ongoing my unless the council directs further revisions what is sent to public hearing tonight would be what would be the subject of the public hearing but there isn't anything that restricts the council from having future meetings to discuss this make revisions for example i know there are some councillors who are very good wordsmiths who may want to go through the document and fix a lot of potentially grammatical problems. And I wouldn't consider that a substantive change, and I might be directed to make those changes, and I would do that. I think a substantive change would, re would require some meeting of the council to discuss those changes. Even without any substantive change between now and the public hearing, that doesn't mean that at the public hearing there couldn't at that point be very substantive changes to the draft document. Yes, it's still in draft. It's still a draft. But this is a draft that goes out to the public for the purposes of the public to comment at the public hearing. And then at some point subsequent to that, we would adopt a comprehensive plan that may or may not contain exactly what's written today. I was just curious because the land trust had emailed us a letter, I think, today with suggestions for, I thought, substantive changes. So would that be incorporated before or, or discussed before? Or would it that wait till the public hearing? Yeah, I, I won't make any changes to this draft unless I'm directed to by someone who has the authority to tell me to do that. Which would be us. Yeah. Okay. Further discussion? Questions, Maureen? Uh, and just to, I guess, respond, Sarah, to um, your point about the land trust comments, um, I, I'm not prepared. I just received those comments today. I was away for several days, and I'm not prepared to um, do anything beyond what was in our package that I ha did have a chance to review over the weekend, but did not have a chance to review comments that were mailed late. But I'm certainly willing to consider them as we go forward and in the context of the public hearing. So that's just speaking for myself. <laughs> David, comments? Um, it, it, no, I think this protocol is fine with the understanding that the comments that we receive at the public hearing, including comments from the land trust, whether they be what we receive today in writing or whether it be additional comments received at the public hearing. Um, would be considered by the council with an opportunity, should we desire to do so, to have another workshop before we actually finalize the document for approval. 
Other comments? I just had we one. We have a motion I, on the table. I haven't seen any of the comments of the land trust. I don't know if you have, Maureen. It would be very good if it'd be formally submitted to the clerk so that we know what it is that's being discussed. Uh, yeah. And I think for before we have further discussion, we probably should have a motion on the table that we can discuss. Ann? I'd like to um, move that we schedule a public hearing for Monday, September 10th, 2007 at 7.30 p.m. on the proposed new comprehensive plan, including those revisions contained in the June 28th, 2000 memorandum from the town planner, Maureen O'Meara, based on discussions that occurred at the June 14th, 2007 town council workshop meeting. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? Okay. All in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, zero. It's a vote. And item 111 is the proposed policy relating to the removal of trees on town-owned land. And Maureen, you're up again. New folder. Uh, this issue kind of evolved, and I, I, just to give you a, a minute of background, um, the Conservation Commission is a, a, a very frugal group, and uh, they, they take their responsibility seriously. So when we had the storms and all the trees came down, um, they had a meeting, and even prior to the meeting, different members of the commission were going out, checking trails that they live nearby, clearing down trees. Uh, we had a couple of uh, volunteers who are part of the fledgling neighborhood liaison project that the commission has been sponsoring who cleared tree. They went out and cleared the trees on the trails that they had walked, worked on. So their, their approach has been very hands-on, very volunteer focused. Um, but there were a lot of trees down and the public works director and I agreed that if he got any calls he should send them to me and I would take them to the commission so they could make a decision on how they wanted to handle it. Well in the meantime I was making some some decisions and it seemed appropriate that it was really more of a land management policy and not just something staff should be giving people answers to. So I wrote up my responses, I gave it to the Conservation Commission and said I really think you may want to come up with some guidelines as how we want to handle these things. Um, they discussed it, agreed those were appropriate approaches, I gave that to the manager, and he agreed that it really was something that is a land management policy for town-owned land and that the council should really have a say in how that's being handled. And the, the general approach is a very frugal approach from the public resources standpoint. Uh, it is that if there are any trees down on trails that the public should call me or the Public Works Department, who then just calls me anyway. And the Conservation Commission is going to do their best to go out and clear trails themselves. Where a very large tree has come down, or they just don't seem to be able to, to get the, the time or the energy to get it together, they will contract out for clearing of town trails. Where a tree comes down on town-owned land that does not block a trail, um, the policy will be that the tree will be left where it is. Um, in some cases, uh, butters don't want that to happen. They would like to have all their trees vertical, none of them horizontal. And in an effort to try to strike a compromise between these different, um, these different goals, the decision was, was made that if a property owner that abuts trail calls the town and a tree is down, that is tree is down on property that does not have a trail, if the property owner is willing to remove the tree themselves, to remove only the dead tree and not any of the other vegetation around it, and to not expand their yard, that we would consider that an act of volunteerism that we would appreciate. Um, but otherwise, the town will not be responsible for removing trees that are on, the fallen on town land that do not block town trails. Further, if there is a tree that's that's dead that someone would like to remove on town property that they can contact again the town and we'll make sure that in fact it is dead and they would be given permission to remove dead trees. So that's, that's just there for the, the council to discuss. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. Cynthia? I, I think 
the only question I had about was um, uh, number two on the draft trees down in town open space policy where mm -hmm. it talks about trees down in open space and it says when trees fall down on town land and are not blocking town trails the town will not be removing those trees I'm just wondering if we want a little wiggle room so that if we want to remove them we can and, and we don't have to justify ourselves like there may be circumstances where we just want to remove a tree and it seems like this policy might restrict the town so I thought maybe we should make it discretionary that we're not compelled to but if we want to we can I had a kind of the, the flip side concern that these down trees do provide habitat for a lot of critters and there may be instances where we don't want the tree or the conservation commission doesn't want the tree removed it's on town land even though an abutter wants it removed so i'd like to see a little more um, <coughs> ability of the conservation commission and the town to say yay or nay depending on the circumstances you know we spent a lot of time last year working on the Ha the rabbit habitat and I don't know if these trees provide habitat for rabbits but it just seemed to me that we'd want some ability to say no we like that tree down in that particular spot I, I don't know whether we want to yeah, the, 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 it. What we're trying to avoid is having to have a committee meeting, commission meeting, every time that there's a tree. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's a, it's a lot easier, in, particularly on town conservation land, and I'd like to see the word town conservation land in two rather than just town land, uh, to make it clear. It, it's a lot easier, particularly when you read the note here for wildlife management purposes, to leave the trees there. That's the proper wildlife management. These are on conservation lands when you you read most of the conservation restrictions, the intent is to keep them as natural as possible. So if, if they're not blocking trees, the, the hope is that we would deal with the critters and we wouldn't have to call a meeting every time someone felt differently. There are, I mean, especially with the last storms, I mean, we've known a lot of trees came down and there were people who were calling, you know, well, I've got something coming out and I can have them move that tree at the same time they're taking down the trees that are on my property. And so there, as, as Mr. McGovern pointed out, there is often a time constraint where you may have a window of opportunity. Um, you know, people are going to, quite frankly, there has been some pressure for the town to take responsibility to remove all the trees. And this is, this is really rather a frugal policy where we're saying you're going to have to live with it. I don't think there are going to be many people who are going to ask us to remove trees that aren't immediately adjacent to their house. So the trees that are falling down in the woods that aren't right next to someone's manicured lawn, they're probably not going to be going anywhere anyway. But I can make these revisions and bring it back to you. Cynthia? Well, I think Excuse me, the concern that I raised just a minute ago would be um, addressed by, I think, inserting just the word conservation in number two, when trees fall down on town conservation land. Um, that It just suggests to me that it is an area that's already been designated as a habitat for wildlife and therefore the policy for allowing the trees just to remain makes sense. I guess when I read it at first, I was thinking, geez, that's a little town land, any tree falls down, they're not supposed to, they're not supposed to pick it up. So if the word conservation gets the number two, I'm happy. Okay. David? I had two questions or comments, Maureen. On item number one, when trees fall on a trail, is it the intent that um, citizens be able to remove a tree that's fallen across the trail without first getting permission from the town? You know, I did have, um, I had a conservation commission member who came to the meeting and said, oh, yeah, I already took care of all that. 
and didn't call me, he just did it. Um, there was another member of the public who had been involved in some trail work, was not a member of the commission, who um, is part of an email group, and another commission member said, I think someone's already cleared that up, and he emailed back, yeah, that was me. So I actually don't want to discourage members of the public who, I mean, most of these trails are, when you see it, you see it, and there's a tree across it, and it's pretty obvious, and I think we should be encouraging people who live near those trails to feel a little, a little bit of ownership and willingness to pitch in and help. So I would rather not say you can't do anything unless you call somebody. Um, some of these trees, it's pretty obvious they're, they're in a place where we really don't want them. So it, it, That's fine. <laughs> um, I think as a matter of policy, that's probably the right decision. I just wanted to make, I, I think as written, okay. um, it leaves open the ability of a citizen to do that. I just wanted to make sure that that was the intent. Okay. On number two, can you explain the last sentence of that that says, under no circumstances should the homeowner's yard increase <laughs> in size to include town-owned land? I didn't understand what that was intended it's, to It is cover. a chronic problem for anyone who owns undeveloped land adjacent to neighborhoods. Uh, where people's yards just magically tend to increase in size beyond the property boundaries of the land they own. And the town is, no, is not exempt from that creep that tends to happen. And the big concern that I have when you're saying to someone, okay, you can take the tree down, you know, lots of people, I was speaking to the public works director just the other day, and we talked about people like to clean the forest. And, you know, there shouldn't be anything down on the ground. It should just be pine needles and straight trees and no underbrush. And, you know, the underbrush is what makes it a natural area. So the concern is that if someone goes in and takes out a down tree, well, there's a lot of space left underneath it. We don't want to see grass growing there afterwards. We want the grass line to stay where it was and that over time that open space gets new trees in it. So that was the intent. Um, your yard stays where it is, regardless of whether the tree fell or not. Okay, I just didn't understand what was intended okay. there. Thank you. Further questions of Maureen? Do we have a motion? Ann? I move that we um, adopt this policy with the one change in the draft on, on number two in the section trees down in open space to say in the first line one trees trees fall down on town conservation land is there a second second okay. discussion all in favor five six zero it's a vote Thank you, Maureen. Okay, I see a number of people in the audience who are here for item 119. So I wonder if anyone would like to make a motion to take item 119 out of order so that we can let these fine citizens go home if they choose. They're welcome to stay for the entire meeting. But Cynthia? So moved. Second. All in favor? Six zero. Okay. Item 119 is the repair of storm damage to Cliff House Beach. Michael, would you tell yeah. us about that? Yeah, thank you, Marian. Cliff House Beach is off Seaview C Avenue. Seaview Avenue, isn't it? Yeah, the, the thing from the t engineer says Seaview Road. But anyway, Seaview Avenue, which is just before you get to the, the cookie jar, which is the, the landmark. Uh, Seaview Avenue goes off there. We actually own the lot that, that goes down to the beach. Uh, the neighbors in that area, just talking about neighbors adopting something, they've really adopted that beach over the long term, that parcel, and have made quite a few repairs to it, uh, have uh, maintained the lawn at the top of it. And what happened during the Patriot State storm is that there was a concrete stairway that went all the way down to the beach, and the ocean just went under that and wiped off everything under those stairways. So if you've been down to see it, the stairway just goes down and it's, uh, you know, like one of those flying staircases in an old home. It's, uh, it's unsupported and therefore uh, has the potential of being 
very unsafe. Uh, there was also a lot of damage in terms of what ended up on the beach in terms of uh, materials and other unnatural things that, that really don't belong on the beach. Uh, Bob and Oast Associates, Bob Malley and Oast Associates has met with uh, the main DEP. Uh, they've also met with uh, FEMA, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency, and Bob met, met with them as just as last Friday morning, last Friday, and you know, FEMA has indicated a willingness to, to fund 75% of the cost of the repairs to the beach. They were a little bit uh, shaky on the engineering portion of it, uh, on whether or not they'll fund that. We don't have a definitive answer yet. That's about 6000 of the estimated $49,000 total, which does include a significant contingency. Uh, you know, it, it was just one of these things that happened during the storm. The staff recommendation uh, is that you uh, approve uh, the expenditure of up to $49,000 for repairs relating to the storm damages to the town on Cliff House Beach with an estimated 75 percent of the construction cost to be paid by the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency. And we're still hopeful that they might pay for the concept for the uh, engineering as well, but I can't 100 percent assure you of that this evening. Okay. Do we have a motion? Madam Chair, I have a question okay. for the manager. Um, so would that $49,000, the town would be authorized to spend 49000 with the 75 percent of the cost to be reimbursed by FEMA? In other words, the town would lay out forty nine and then exactly. get up to 75 percent of that exactly. back? Okay. I just wanted to make sure. Then I, I'd like to make a motion. Uh, was there another if, question? Oh, no, sorry. first. Okay. Then you can um, motion. I uh, move that we um, that the council authorize the town manager to spend up to forty nine thousand dollars for repairs related to storm damages to the town owned Cliff House Beach, with an estimated seventy five percent of the cost to be reimbursed by FEMA. And is there a second? Second the motion. Any discussion. Did you put the word construction before cost in your motion? 75, with an estimated 75 percent of the construction cost? I did not, but I can. Good. Just to make it clear. Okay. And David? And the construction cost, that would include the OST stuff, too? OST, the OST expense might have to be 100 percent funded by the town. Okay. That's my point. So, the six then fine. Then I would add construction, the word construction before the word cost. Okay. And it's been seconded? By Jim, David, you had your hand up. Um, yes, thank you. If part of the uh, acceptance of this motion you know, includes the contemplation that our um, public works director uh, will be signing the proposed <laughs> contract that's attached to this from um, L.P. Murray and Son. I'd like to suggest that um, the indemnity and hold harmless language on this either be crossed out before it's signed or that it be reviewed by the town's attorney before we'll, this is signed. We'll have it reviewed by the attorney. I, I read this language and it is rather all encompassing. It's not standard language. No, it's not. Okay. Then, then you I'll notice that he lifted it somewhere else because he's talking about plowing and sanding, and <laughs> I don't think he's going to be doing that on the beach. No, but it goes far beyond that. It does. Just, yeah, it I, does. I don't think it's appropriate yeah. to be in there. And I think we can just recognize that the town manager and the public works director will come up with a contract that's acceptable, yeah. contract language acceptable to them that protects the town. I want to double check to make sure none of the members of the public have concerns about this. I, there are a number of people from the public here. Is there anyone who would like to speak to this issue and ha or have concerns about the direction <laughs> the town is going? I know I got a couple of emails which sounded as if people were supportive, but. Thank you. I'm Tom Myers. On, I live on Seaview Avenue and I'm one of the folks that have been um, acting as a steward of the beach for not as long as others, but certainly um, in the recent past and particularly since the storm damage. And I, I would encourage the council 
to um, consider this opportunity to leverage some of these FEMA funds to take care of a problem that we've been battling for quite a while, specifically the erosion uh, behind the stairways as well as the damage that's been occurring when uh, larger storms come. Each spring and again in the fall, and frankly after every storm, a number of the neighbors go down with chainsaws and other equipment and try to cart off as, as much of the things as we can. And I, um, um, I have some of my buddy neighbors here that were um, at the last storm where we were carting up literally floating docks and, and other things that came up. And I appreciate the efforts of um, the, the town public works director to take the initiative, um, and particularly with um, getting the FEMA folks to come take a look at this um, project and as well as um, some of the preliminary engineering and, and other projects that I've been working on in, in another town nearby. Um, <laughs> we've had uh, similar kinds of efforts go ongoing and having a, a sound um, engineering analysis of the exact level of effort that's required for the project as well as a con um, construction firm giving you a good solid estimate has been very helpful in, in getting these funds. Um, again, meeting with uh, FEMA folks that um, Mr. Malley's been able to do and putting that together has been very important. I think that um, we'd be, uh, the town would be wise to take advantage of these additional funds that are available to us to see this project accomplished. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Those of you that aren't aware, Captain Myers, uh, I always call him Captain Myers, retired Coast Guard, uh, in addition to heading the bus, South Portland bus system, also is the manager of the waterfront. Uh, for the city of South Portland, so is well aware of some of these issues. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> My name is Tom McCulka. I live on uh, Four Mountain View Road. I think uh, Bob Malley probably recognizes my name uh, as uh, Chief McGoldrick. Um, I, I'm really uh, pleased with the support that I've gotten from the folks from the town. I've probably called Bob a half a dozen times. Uh, to ask him different questions on progress on how things are going. He's very patiently either answered my questions or called me back every time. So that was a real pleasure. And uh, Chief McGoldrick, um, uh, I was working with him to figure out how much we could burn of what was on the beach that we couldn't bring up. And uh, we crossed paths and a bunch of cell phone calls back and forth. And he went down himself and, uh, and told us what we could do and what we couldn't do. So the, the support so, so far has been great. Um, this, uh, I've been in this neighborhood for about five years now. This, uh, the beach is an incredible center of the community. Uh, people take their kids down there all the time. Uh, we have a, a, a neighbor that lives up the street from us, uh, Bill Orkut, who remembers when the stairs were put in uh, back in the 40s, I think, or the, or the mid-30s. And uh, it's just really important to us. And, and to go down there after the storm and see the, the incredible damage, the amount of wood that was put up there, the docks, um, the seaweed, the rocks, there was this incredible berm around the stairs. And about 20 or 30 people got together and, uh, and spent two or three days digging this out um, to a point where the, the folks, the engineers, could actually go down and see what had happened because it was actually buried at the end of the storm. Um, so the, great to see the folks of the city or the, the town get together to do this. Some of us are here. Uh, really pleased to see the support from the town and the amount of energy that's put into this. Uh, it was great. I heard two or three days ago this was actually on the agenda tonight. So uh, we, we really hope that you, you, uh, you approve this and move forward with it because it's really important for, uh, for our community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I have one more, one more question. Um, will this 49000 come from the public works budget? Is that the budget line we're talking about? No, we have a budget line that we've been carrying, just storm-related costs, that we just charge everything to the storm off to. Is this charged to last year's fiscal year? Are we carrying no, that? because this is a new thing for this fiscal year. We've been carrying the last year. We haven't received any monies back from FEMA yet. Bob Scott went over most of the expenses with them on Friday. Uh, and we'll be getting some money back that, you know, we're going to lose some money out of the deal because it's only 75 percent, but a lot of our out of pocket, but that we ate last year in the last fiscal year. We just ate it. So I'm not sure I understand. So this is a fiscal 08. This will be fiscal uh, 08. Expensive. This expense. will be fiscal 08. Um, and whatever we're left, whatever reimbursed amount that we're, unreimbursed Un amount that we're left with would be coming from the public works budget or would be coming from it, where? It's like anything at this time of the year, you hope overall the budget comes out 
in balance. I'm, We're not, I'm not specifically cutting another budget at this point to do that. Okay. I have every confidence yeah. that the overall budget will be mm -hmm. fine, but I just wanted to know where this was going to be charged. It's, if, it's, if anywhere. It's just going to sort of hang there, and if at the end of okay. the year it's not that's, funded, that's then fine. I just wanted the, to make yeah, sure. The June meeting, you'll be, I'll be asking for an appropriation to cover it. Okay, and I would like to, um, I, I like Councillor Backer's suggestion, and I'd like to amend my motion just to add the um, uh, language about the town negotiating appropriate contract language. Okay. It's yes. okay with the second. Okay. Further discussion? I'd just like Jim? to reiterate what folks have said, what a real gem this property is. I grew up on Cottage Farms Road and spent a good deal of my childhood on the beach. And uh, not only is it a good place to go with your family and with friends, but it's also a great place to go to be alone. And it's uh, an inspirational spot. And unlike the beach around the corner, Casino Beach or Maiden Cove Beach, whatever you want to call it, this is open to the public. And uh, it, it is really a truly remarkable place. <laughs> I support the motion, obviously. Okay. All in favor? Three, four, five, six, zero. We're on a unanimity roll tonight. Okay. Thank you all for coming. And again, you're welcome to stay for the rest of our meeting. <laughs> it will be very exciting. But <laughs> Thank you again. Okay, we are back to item 112, um, proposed process to develop a Cape Elizabeth agricultural profile. Michael, would you like to speak yeah, to this? Yeah, I'll speak to this. You had had a discussion at your workshop back in uh, June, was it? Uh, yeah, when you reviewed the comprehensive plan of the need to develop an agricultural profile of, of Cape Elizabeth. Uh, that's, in essence, looking at the particular needs of the farms in town, perhaps hiring a consultant to do it. Maureen uh, wrote an outline on it, but it, it uh, as you notice, it was dated June 29th, and you, there was, had been some discussion, as I read in that, that you want to have some discussion this evening, but it struck me that it really needs a little more cost estimate of what this would cost. It needs a little bit of flushing out of what this committee would look like. So therefore, you know, I would have recommended we table it to August, but since there's only going to be four councilors here in August, I'm recommending that it be tabled to September 10th so we can pull those, those things together for your consideration. Okay, is there a motion? I just had a comment. If I remember right, there was some sense of urgency to getting this thing rolling among the farmers. I, I, I think, uh, Jim, th there is a sense of urgency among some of the farmers, but this issue is, is much bigger than, than at first glance in terms of uh, you know, speaking with some of the farmers and, and what they're looking for to come out of this process, I think we need to be careful to set it up right to begin with. Uh, it's not something that, you know, can be done in a month or two. It's uh, uh, just, you know, eventually the ordinance language would go to the ordinance committee and public hearings. And it's, it, whenever you amend the zoning ordinance, it's a nine-month period anyway. And for that reason, it wouldn't be ready for uh, next year's growing season. Uh, because it's nine months once it gets to the council. Thank you. Is there a motion? Yes. What's the nine month? What's what did you? I just if know if you look at something comes into the council, yes. and then uh, if it's a zoning amendment, it needs to get referred be referred to the planning board. The planning board then needs to have a separate public hearing, and then it comes back to the council. The council oftentimes will refer it to the ordinance committee. The ordinance committee refers it back to the council. The council then votes to set a public hearing on it, and then it's, if the council then adopt, has a meeting, the, the public hearing is another 30 days, and then if the council adopts something, it's still another 30 days to become effective. You add all that together, and particularly with a little bit of, you know, the timing of when meetings occur, and most amendments to the zoning ordinance take a minimum of nine months. Is there a motion? Cynthia. I move that we table this item to the September 10th, 2007 town council meeting. And is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? There's no discussion allowed on a tabling motion. 
Oh, that's right. Thank you. Okay. All in favor? Thank you. Six zero. I'm sorry. I would sorry. Not have... I didn't mean to be rude. No, I I need the uh, memory refresher. It's been a while since I've sat in this chair. Okay. Item, and I I would not have kept saying. Do I have a motion? <laughs> I would have encouraged more questions because I had one more comment to make. <laughs> we'll wait. Item 113, purchase of 7 Holman Road. And the managers moved yes. to a different spot. I have, Marianne. Thank you. Just to, to give the bearings, this is Scott Dyer Road along here. This is Dr. Dickinson's uh, uh, dentist's office. This would be, I call it the Balfour Real Estate Office. It's Caldwell Banker, is it? The one on the corner. Mm -hmm. they, most people know it as the Balfour office. But that's the bearings. Uh, this is the library parking lot. This is the adult section of the library. Uh, this is the, the back of that section. This is the link between the two. This is the entrance to the library. This is the very old library, the Thomas Memorial Library, with the building that was built in the back of it and with large support from the Lions Club back in the 50s. Uh, for a couple of years, the uh, Thomas Memorial Library trustees have begin have begun began voicing concern uh, with the space in the library and I you know the need I, I saw Jay Sherman the librarian quoted in one of the newspapers for every book they buy they have to throw one away and as you can see the library is, keeps looking for every available space and particularly as they've gone into more programming as they've gone into videos and the rest of the things books on tape that the libraries do these days. And, and the, the, the desire for people to go to the library to have it a place of, of you know, just like we were talking about the Cliff House Beach, it's a place people like to go and repose and sit quietly and read books and poetry and whatever they do. Uh, the space is limited. Uh, a few years back, the town bought, you can, really can't see it, the yellow, this lot here. Uh, it's a grass open field. I tried to get a parking lot built there a couple of times and the town council rejected it every time, as sometimes happens. Uh, which is probably a good thing, because um, this is Holman Field, by the way, Holman Road, which we also own, although the, the folks here have legal rights to it, so that we need to maintain the access to the places on the other, the other on the front on uh, Ocean House Road. Anyway, uh, a, a for sale sign went up at this intersection about a month and a half ago saying the property was for sale with Water Glen Realty, uh, made a contact with them. The asking price was $347,000. The town council had a uh, executive session a month ago at which it was announced that you were going in to discuss this. Uh, you gave me some guidance at that meeting, but no definite votes. There's never a definite vote in an executive session. I went back and spoke to uh, the, the representative of the owner, uh, the, rep the, the broker from uh, Water Glen Realty, and I've signed a purchase and sale agreement that the town would purchase the property for $305,000 subject to really to the usual language things, but subject to uh, the town council having an affirmative vote this evening. And secondly, that the tenant who is now there could stay, I think the date is mid-August. And Tom Leahy's, our town attorney, has worked out details uh, with that. As, as you see, by adding this parcel here in blue, and you look at the current foot of the print of the library, this is a very historic, aesthetically significant building, aesthetically significant, the pond, former Pond Cove School Annex. The, this is the original Thomas Memorial Library that <coughs> William Widgery Thomas gave to the town uh, back uh, a couple of centuries ago now, uh, two centuries ago, not a full 200 years ago. And, you know, very old building. The difficulty with doing anything with the library is that you want to maintain this beautiful fr facade, frontage. You want to maintain the historic library. So then you look at, you know, where you're going to expand the library, what are you going to do? You're boxed in back here with the playground. There's already a, a deficit of playground space for the schools. You can't build in front. You could possibly do here, but what do you do with the parking? The real benefit of buying this lot is it squares off this whole library parcel. And as you can see, just from the size of this versus the footprint of the library, that this gives a significant opportunity to come up with a totally new concept plan on how the library might be expanded. Uh, 
I've reviewed this with Jay. He's discussed it with some of the trustees. They've taken a formal vote on it. They felt it would be presumptuous, and the timing's been quick on this. Uh, but anyway, I'd recommend that you authorize me to purchase this for the $305,000, that you provide an additional $15,000 for the, the closing costs, and also there, there will be some costs during the year for utilities while we're deciding uh, what we do. So a total of $320,000. But those funds come from the undesignated surplus uh, for this, and uh, that you also ask the library trustees to ask the the Thomas More Library Charitable Foundation, their interest in, <coughs> the wording on the agenda is a little bit different, but it's really their interest in funding the concept plan, although this is, this is worded a little more diplomatically. Uh, but uh, that's the, the town manager's recommendation. Thank you, Michael. Any questions for Michael, Cynthia? Um, in, assuming that the town, in fact, purchases the property, I imagine there will be a significant lapse of time between the purchase of the property and an eventual action. Is there a, an opportunity to rent out and, and, and recoup some of the purchase price in rental income? There, there's a limited opportunity. It, uh, the, I have to be careful what I say. I, you weren't here at the last council meeting. No, I wasn't. I got the sense from some of your peers on the council uh, that they would prefer that we not get in a landlord-tenant responsibility and and I from what I've learned this past month I think that was a sound judgment in in terms of the counselors who expressed that okay. Fair enough. yeah you know it was again it, 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 to work around this obviously there was some discussion of that in executive session mm -hmm. but I'm not allowed to say there was no vote and I can't I can't go into the details of what was said in executive session Although, you know, now most of it's public, the real reason for going into executive session was to give me guidance on what the purchase price might be, and this uh, 305000 is within that guidance that the council gave me in, in terms of, you know, you might go back and offer them this. Is there a motion? Ann? I'd like to move that the council authorize the town manager to purchase uh, 7 Holman <coughs> Road on behalf of the town with a purchase price of $305,000, the funds for the purchase and related legal and survey expenses, and the 2007-08 utilities and maintenance costs of an estimated $15,000 would be appropriated from the undesignated fund balance. And also as part of my motion, I'd like to propose that the council inquire through the Thomas Memorial Library found, um, uh, trustees uh, that they inquire of the Library Foundation if they would like to assist the town by helping fund um, a concept study for the future expansion of the Thomas Memorial Library. And is there a second? Second. Discussion? I should note for the record that I am the council um, representative and member of the Thomas Memorial Library Foundation, but I do not see any conflict, so I do intend to vote on this. I just wanted to mention that for the record. Okay, no further discussion. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, zero. It's a vote. Thank you. Just if I could mention, the closing on that has been scheduled for tomorrow, so uh, <laughs> it'll be quick implementation of the council decision. Okay, item 114 is acceptance of open space at Cross Hill. We had um, the map and property um, in our package, and uh, Maureen O'Meara is here if there are any questions. And if there are no questions of Maureen, I'd entertain a motion. Jim? Uh, I would move uh, that we consider and adopt the Planning Board's recommendation for the acceptance of approximately 34,927 feet of open space at Cross Hill near its intersection with Wells Road. Mm, is there a second? Second. Okay. Discussion? All in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, zero. OK. 
Okay, item 115 is acceptance of an access right of way and related rights to the extension of Bigelow Way, and the planning board has recommended acceptance. I just want to apologize for not giving you a map of this. Uh, and maybe Maureen could explain where it is and what it is. The council chairman is well aware of it since it's across the street from his home. But we have an easement deed in our package. Yeah. But it Bigelow Way is a, was a paper street and um, a property owner who, who owned property adjacent to it wanted to develop a lot and so they received what we call a private access way permit from the planning board. So you are not accepting Bigelow Way. What you're accepting is a right to use a turnaround on Bigelow Way on behalf of the emergency vehicles of the town if they ever need to provide emergency services. Where is it? Bigelow Way is it's in Shore Acres, it's just off of Katahdin, I believe. Down the hill, down onto the Katahdin hill. in Shore Acres, and it's right on the right. Okay. okay. Other questions of Maureen? Is there a motion? <coughs> Cynthia. I move we accept um, the um, access right of way and related rights to the extension of Bigelow Way as set forth in the uh, packet at item 115. Yes. Do we need to accept the easement deed? You do. Okay. So I will we'll amend my motion thank to you. accept the easement deed which um, describes the access right of way and related rights to the extension of Bigelow Way as set forth in the agenda as item 150. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, zero. It's a vote. Maureen, I think you can go home now if you'd like. Oh, you have one more? 117, Chief. 117. Can we take 117 out of order? 116 will be quick. Okay, we'll go to 116 then. Um, this is approval of the annual liquor license for the Good Table Restaurant, April. There are no concerns with this liquor license. Okay. And the police chief is here, so I assume if he had a concern, he would rise at this point. Is there a motion? Move to approve the liquor license for the Good Table res uh, Restaurant. And is there a second? Second. Discussion? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, zero. It's a vote. Okay. Item 117 is the consideration of the report of the road safety <laughs> working group. Cynthia, you are the chair of that. Do yes, you want to speak to that? Um, yes. Um, the uh, Cape Elizabeth Road Safety Working Group has met uh, a number of times, and as you know, uh, the town council adopted a draft traffic calming policy as uh, part of our work. In addition, um, the road safety working group um, undertook a few other initiatives. I direct your attention to um, the third page of the um, packet item 117, where under the conclusion, it says, to summarize, specifically, the Road Safety Working Group is asking the Town Council uh, for authorization on the following items. And the first item is um, authorizing the Road Safety Working Group to hold a design workshop for the Route 77 Shore Road Scott Dyer intersection. Uh, this is um, the subject of the meeting tomorrow with the Maine Department of Transportation. It's ongoing. Um, hopefully, we'll someday. Uh, be finalized and the hope of the road safety working group is that members of the community will have input on the overall design of the intersection at Shore Road and Scott Dyer and not just leave the design concepts up to the main department of transportation because we have a lot of um, talent and uh, good taste in our own community and um, if we publicized a workshop and invited public comment on some design concepts that we I think have a better product and included in that meeting would be a Department of Transportation representative. Um, the second um, item we would like uh, the Town Council to consider and act on is to um, create a Shore Road Path Committee uh, to begin the process of um, exploring a Shore Road Path, which would be a, 
recreational path adjacent to Shore Road. Um, the, it's envisioned that the committee would go through the appropriate appointments committee process um, and the purpose of the formation of the committee would be to meet with property owners and prepare a path plan for future town council consideration. And finally, um, the road safety working group was, uh, is asking the town council to add the projects that are described in your packet, and I won't go through all of them. I'm assuming everyone's had a chance or will have a chance at some point to look them over, adding the, the, the projects that we um, prioritized and studied and got professional opinions on um, relating to enhanced pedestrian and bike safety. Um, and you'll see that it includes some uh, sidewalk projects that are already included in the bond package. So assuming the bond is approved and goes forward, some of these things will already be uh, accomplished. But the other items, we would like at least for them to be included in the 10-year um, CIP uh, beginning in FY09 so that the work, this is sort of an accumulation of work that was began with the uh, P2P committee and has been um, also uh, noted by the Comprehensive Plan Committee to just uh, get these, these priority projects in um, queue in the CIP. Uh, the agenda suggests that we'll have a workshop on this, which I'm not necessarily opposed to, although my priority would be to just act on all the issues tonight and get approval of a design workshop um, to have um, the PATH committee be um, recognized or authorized to begin a formation and to add projects, but I'm not sure that we're going to actually accomplish that. That would be my hope, uh, but I'll accept the workshop as well. Okay. Thank you, Cynthia. Mm -hmm. Michael, did you want to? I just wanted to add why. Uh, uh, why I suggest us go to a workshop. <laughs> On point A, uh, we are meeting with MDOT, as uh, Cynthia mentioned, uh, and the, the plan has always been to, to have a, a design workshop uh, for this. I'm a little bit nervous with the language of authorizing the road safety working group to hold it. Uh, you know, I think they ought to be participants in it, but as, you know, MDOT is controlling that project and we really got to get MDOT engaged and the, the, their style is they usually run the design workshop. So it, it's a grammatical thing. But I, I do think, I definitely think that, you know, that, that will be occurring, needs to occur, and hopefully will occur very soon. I do have concern with B and why, why I felt it should be a workshop. <laughs> that is about a, but the estimate here is a little over $2 million project. And if you add up C as well, it's about $6.5 million between those two recommendations. And I think to, to begin to have a committee meeting on one of them without looking at the bigger picture might be a little bit premature before the council really understands B more and has a chance to look at it, it as well as C. So that's the only reason I suggested to be a workshop because it's quite, you know, particularly with, you know, maybe the library something happening, it's quite a commitment to be looking at about six and a half million dollars worth of projects. And, uh, I just think the council needs to spend a little time looking at the recommendation. Is there a motion? Cynthia? Well, I would move then that we have a um, schedule a workshop um, on the um, work of the road safety working group and specifically a workshop to consider the um, action items that are described in the conclusion section of the road safety uh, working group report dated May 29th, 2007. <coughs> Might I make a modest amendment suggestion that we also accept the report and convey our thanks to the road safety working group um, on all the hard work that's gone forth that they've done so far. Oh, excellent. Excellent suggestion. Yes. And second. Motion. Second. Okay. Um, discussion. Well, I can't miss this opportunity as a pedestrian who uses Shore Road every day. Um, I'm very excited about it. I, I do think we need to have a, a workshop because of the magnitude of the 
expense, but I know between the runners, the walkers, the bikers, and the drivers, um, people are concerned about um, our narrow roads, and, um, and yet they want to maintain the rural character. So um, I think it's a timely topic, and I will support the motion, but I also very much appreciate the work your committee did. Thank you, Mary Ann. So with that, seeing no further comments, all in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, zero. It's a vote. And we are on to item 118. Um, Mary Ann, may, yes. I think I recall that um, at our last road safety working group, we looked at the uh, town council schedule, and it appeared that the next scheduled workshop was in October. I think it was October 11th, if my memory serves. Yeah, and I didn't know if it would be appropriate now to schedule. discuss the possibility of um, scheduling the this particular item for, for that workshop, or I'm not, I'm just not sure how these workshops. Can. Yeah, I, I think that'd be fine. Although I, I did want to mention, there's one scheduled for September 6th, which is before the September council meeting. The council chairman uh, Paul has asked that that be scheduled to reschedule to Tuesday, September 11th, from uh, Thursday, September 6th. So then this could fall in. It, that's with the recycling committee and focusing on recycling issues. So this one would, would nicely follow at the October one. Okay, and I don't think we need a council vote on that. No, but it, but no. it gave me a chance to mention that the September 6th might be changed to sub Tuesday, September 11th. So is that for sure? The council chairman indicated at the end of last week, Friday, that he'd like to see that. With, I'm, it, just, there's no I'm just trying to figure out what to put in my schedule. From, uh, it's moving from uh, the Thursday the 6th to Tuesday, September 11th. And that was on recycling? Oh, with the recycling committee. Okay. Okay. Shall we move on to item 118? And this is the recommendation that the Cape Elizabeth Fire Police Unit now be a part of the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department <coughs> instead of the Cape Elizabeth Police Department. And we had a letter from the Chief of Police to Michael McGovern in our package. Michael, do you want to speak to this at all? I, I think it's fairly self-explanatory. Both Chiefs are here uh, on, on this particular topic. Uh, the Fire Police Unit uh, has been in place now for maybe 20 years, approximately, yeah, about 20 years. And it, it began uh, under the police department when the police saw a need to help direct traffic, particularly around fire scenes. Over the years, the fire police units also been very helpful with Beach to Beacon, <coughs> with some of the events at Fort Williams, as well as particularly accidents uh, and fire scenes helping to close off roads, as well as during the, the storms. Uh, last year, there was a very unfortunate incident in Scarborough where a member of their fire police unit lost their life. Uh, directing traffic, I believe, was out on Route 114 at Running Hill, and it brought up questions about viability coverages and those type things. And in order to more fully cover these individuals who, who are out there during this bad weather it, after dark off, and it was decided during the budget process that we would begin to pay them uh, so that they were clearly employees and they had those protections. So then once we began to pay them, the issue came up, well, we don't we, they really belong in the fire department because that's where we have the, the volunteer type but who are paid on calls uh, to be part of a, a company of the, uh, the fire department. I looked at different policies and the policies are already in place in the administrative code to provide for this. It didn't need a specific amendment. So therefore I just brought this to the council as a uh, recommendation uh, from the chief that I agree with. And it also, as the chief indicates, that uh, uh, Neil uh, Williams met on June 21 with the fire police unit. He explained the thoughts, and at that meeting, no opposition was expressed. Are you saying that you don't need any action of the council? I, I would like to have an authorization to uh, move the fire police unit from the Cape Elizabeth Fire Department to the Cape Elizabeth Police Department. The other way around. I spoke wrong. Police to fire. <coughs> Police to fire. Jim? 
I'd like to make a motion that the town manager should be authorized to move the Cape Elizabeth Fire Police Unit from the police department to the fire department. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Cynthia. I just have a, a quick question. When I was reading through this, um, I wasn't clear. Is it a bargaining unit? Are we talking about? No, it's just a unit. Okay, thank you. Okay. And further discussion? Questions? They, they've been bargaining a little bit this past year, but they're not a bargaining unit. <laughs> they're good folks. They're great folks. Really appreciate Charlie Kennedy and as the leader in the whole group's efforts. All in favor? Six zero. It's a vote. Just, I'd also like to, if you might, for half a minute, thank Brent Sinclair in particular, uh, who took, who has been the staff liaison to this group for many years. He took the place of Neil Williams, who uh, was the earliest staff liaison to this group. So. Uh, They've had good support from the police department. I want to thank uh, Brent and uh, Neil earlier for his service uh, working with them. Okay. Now um, we're on to item 120, which is appointment to the Spurwink Meeting House Preservation Committee and your chairman of the Appointments Committee. Would you speak to this, please? Yes, thank you. Um, the Appointments Committee met and had a number of Good candidates for the remaining open slot on the Spurwink Meeting House Preservation Committee. Um, and we'd like to thank everyone for their interest. Uh, we are recommending the appointment of Catherine Ray of Spurwink Avenue to serve on the committee. She uh, lives across the street from the church, and we were trying to get someone who was from the neighborhood. And you can't get much closer than she lives. <laughs> To the church. Unless the you're church. in the back. Yeah, unless you're, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but they don't least, live At there. least someone that would contribute a lot to the, com <laughs> to the committee. Um, so uh, I'd like to put that in the form of motion that we, uh, that the council approve the appointment of Kathy Ray to serve on this committee. And Is I there a thank second? Thank everybody who, who helped. Um, volunteer for all the town boards and commissions, um, as well as my fellow counselors, uh, David and Marianne, who serve on the committee with me. Second. Although, for the record, I was absent from your deliberations. Okay, discussion? All in favor? Six zero. It's a vote. <coughs> And now we are on to item 121, Spurwink Avenue Temporary Construction Easements. And it is recommended that the Town Council note that Maine Department of Transportation's offer of $6,400 for easements necessary for the upcoming paving work on Spurwink Avenue. Michael, do you have anything further to add? This will actually be a taking by the state of these temporary easements and the, the, the permanent drainage easements. Bob and I have looked at them, and they have no negative effect on the community, nothing but positive effect. And uh, just no action is really required other than to note, note it, because they're going to take it anyway. Uh, but I, just a way of updating you on this project and letting you know that they are making some offers to uh, other citizens. One of the particular issues they discovered was between Scott Dyer and the the, uh, the electrical substation there, the road was never officially laid out. And part of this process is, is they're laying out that road and they are providing you know, some more sizable payments to the, the folks who own the land on either side of that section of this project uh, because they're making it a full width state road. And no action is No required, action is so. needed other than you might move to note it but, or you can take no action, whatever you want. What's the pleasure of the council? No action. <laughs> no okay. action. Um, no, I just raise it because you only have a 30-day opportunity to put up a big stink, and I, I'm just giving you due notice that this would be the opportunity. OK. Now um, we're at that point in the agenda. If there are any citizens, I see staff and reporters, but you are also citizens. So if there are any citizens who would like to discuss Items not on our agenda. Now is the time. Okay. We thank you for for your perseverance through this lengthy agenda. 
Madam, um, Madam Chair, I forgot to thank um, our assistant town manager, Deborah Lang, for her, for her assistance with the appointments committee, and I wanted to make sure I included her. And thank you. And I just note that the next town council meeting is Monday, August 13th at 7.30 p.m. in the chambers. And a motion to... Did you have anything else, Mark? Yeah, just that, as I mentioned earlier, there, there will only be four councillors present due to commitments of various sorts that other councillors have in August. So if any councillor has any issue that comes up that they're unable to be there, uh, let us know so that the rest of us don't show up and not have a quorum. So. Yes. Okay. A motion to adjourn would be in order. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? 6-0. I think every item on our agenda was unanimous tonight, and uh, it's a credit to the council, I think, and the staff. Thank you all. <laughs>